heard this story about Josiah, whose family he feels is going hungry. Uh, He's so desperate he steals a donkey. The dry season in Africa makes you feel desperate. And as I thought about dry seasons and rainy seasons, I thought maybe we should do a season, a series at the Grove. So this month we're titling our series, Rain, Blessings in the Dry Season. But I have to be honest with you, my thinking about dry seasons and rainy seasons didn't start last week in Malawi. It started a couple of weeks before that. So about three or four weeks ago, I was having, I was having lunch with a good friend of mine, Jose Ramos, and we're at Caldwell's Barbecue. Anybody been to Caldwell's here? Best barbecue in Arizona, all right? And I'm not saying that because the manager goes to the Grove here. Maybe I'll get a few freebies, but anyway, it can't hurt. But if you want great barbecue, go there, tell them Palmer sent you, and uh, see what happens. Anyway, so Jose and I are having barbecue there, and, and we're just having a, a, a chat, and I'm kind of sharing my heart about what I'm feeling, because he said, how are you doing? And maybe I said too much, but I started telling about the hard season that I feel we've been going through here at the Grove. Ever since COVID, it's been such a struggle, it feels like, to get people back in church, to fill our ministries again. And, and you know, since COVID, maybe we're back to two-thirds of our population, which means we, it's about two-thirds of our giving, and so financially it's been a dry season. I feel like this has been a dry season we've been going through. And, and Jose, as he's listening to me say how hard things have been, he said, Palmer, you're forgetting something from Scripture. I said, what? What am I missing? He said, you're forgetting that the dry season in the Bible, the dry season always comes before the rains. Wow. I said, Jose, you got to say that again. That's too good. He said, the dry seasons. And there's this pattern in the Bible. The dry season always comes before the rainy season. And so that just kind of filled my heart and my soul. And so when I went to Malawi, I couldn't help but think about the dry season, the rainy season, because the dry season where I had just hit. And, and I think all of us at some time in our lives, we go through dry seasons, don't we? We go through dry seasons when we feel desperate. When you're in the dry season, you're afraid. You feel like a failure. You want to give up. And we can forget that God has this promise of rain. Rain in the Bible, maybe you don't know this, rain is always a picture of blessing and of God's love. So today, if you're going through a dry season, I want to say, hang on. I trust God. He has work for you to do in the dry season. And I want to remind you today that the rain always comes. God always sends the rain. And so I want to start this series today that that we're working on. And I want to use the book of Proverbs as we go through this. I want to talk about lessons in the dry seasons today. Today, I specifically want to talk about financial dry seasons. Because let's be honest. Right now, financially, we are in a down economy. And maybe you feel pressure like you haven't felt since 2008 during the Great Recession. Or maybe it was uh, uh, 1933 if you're here for the Great Depression. I don't know. But it feels like that's coming right now. And if you feel like financially you are in a dry season, there are words of hope and wisdom in in the Proverbs. So grab your Bibles or grab your phone for an app. We're going to hit a number of different scripture verses today. I'm going to start with Proverbs chapter 6. And this is Solomon's first piece of advice for us. He says this. He says, watch the ant, you slugger. And that gets a little tough for us. But he says, consider its ways and be wise. It stores up its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So what is Solomon saying? Solomon is saying, save up, prepare for the dry season. So that's my first lesson from Proverbs for us. Uh, Save. Are, Are you a person that's saving? Right now, it is saving time in Malawi. So when we were there for the last two weeks, outside of every hut in the village was a huge like bamboo storage facility with where they had put all the maize that they had just harvested. And now over the next few weeks, the, the women of the village, they gather and they go hut to hut. It's one hut a, a day. And they take everyone's maize and by hand, they husk it and then they shell it one, one at a time until they fill bags and bags of maize. And then they put that maize up into their rafters for the rest of the year. It's, they're saving up. This is the saving up season in Malawi. 
If you don't save up and prepare for the dry season in Malawi, your family will starve. You won't make it till the next harvest. And so my first challenge to you is to save up. This lesson we see all through the Bible. Do you remember when Pharaoh insists that that Joseph, the slave, interpret his dream. What does Joseph say? When he hears the dream, he says, well, God is telling you, you're going to have seven years of dry season, seven years of drought. drought. It's coming, but before that, you're going to have the rain. So he says, save up for the dry season. I think that's our lesson here. So my first challenge is to build liquidity. Start with maybe an emergency fund of $1,000. You can save it up. I think within a month or two months, you can have $1,000. The problem is most Americans, 40%, not most, 40%, that's less than most, 40% of Americans have no savings. 40% of Americans, just one bill, one surprise emergency bill of $400 or more will put them in a spiral of debt and poverty. So let's say, for example, this summer you're driving through the desert and you blow the radiator and it's $419. For almost half, 40% of Americans can't make that payment, so they'll put it on a card. But then at the end of the month, you can't make the payment. So now your debt grows and it starts a spiral of poverty and debt. So I said the first challenge, if you want something practical, a takeaway, save up $1,000 as an emergency fund. Once you've done that, Spend the rest of this year saving up three to six months of savings so that if you ever lose your job, not that that would ever happen to you, but it happens. It happened in 2008. It can happen again. And so save up. Here's a few practical goals. If I can give you some some rules of thumb on saving. When you're in your 20s, you want to save up 25% 25% of your annual, annual income. So 25%, that's, let's say you make $32,000, that's $8,000. So when you're in your 20s, first rule of thumb is save up 25% of your annual income. Now, here's the problem. Most 20-year-olds that I know aren't so concerned about retirement or saving up. Their biggest concern, at least with guys, is to purchase their first Tesla. You know, it's seven years. It's $700 a month. I want to say stop that right now. Just stop that madness and start with with a 25%. In your 30s, by the time you hit 30 years old, the goal is to save your annual income. By the time you're 35, it's two years of your annual income. By the time you're 40, your goal should be to have three times your annual income in savings. So those are some simple rules of thumb to start with. Here's a second lesson from Proverbs. It's to budget and create financial freedom. Here's what Solomon says next. This is Proverbs 27, verse 23. He says, Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for your riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. So in Solomon's day, a few thousand years ago, they didn't have banks. They didn't have a stock exchange. There was no, thankfully, no Bitcoin. Now, some of you are losing your shirt on Bitcoin. Not that I haven't warned you, and and maybe I'm missing out. Okay, all right, put your money there. Go ahead. But I'm just saying, it's not doing so well. But Solomon's day, there's no stock exchange, no retirement funds, no 401ks. And uh, so he says, so their resources are herds of sheep or herds of goat or herds of cows. And he's saying, pay attention. Know what your budget is. Know how much you have out there. If you want to have financial freedom, if you want to have financial security, if you want to reach your financial goals, you will have to have a budget. And so my my second challenge to you is to take control of your finances and form a budget. Now, What does a budget do? A budget keeps you within your means. Every African, whether it's in West Africa where I grew up, or East Africa in Malawi, whether you're harvesting uh, rice or maize, every African knows that when you put the rice in the rafters, when you put the bags of maize in the rafters, you have to budget. You have to make that last all year long. It's very easy to look up at the rafters and go, oh, shoot, man, we could have a party for the whole village right now. I've got so much. But the wise Africans know that has to last my family for a year. Now, this time, right now in Malawi, everyone's rafters are full. They had the, the, the harvest was in May. So everyone has bags and bags of maize up in their rafters. 
And so right now there are maize buyers going around the villages with big wads of cash. And they'll walk up to people and say, hey, you don't need all that maize. Let me buy some from you. And the temptation is there. They'll say, hey, you could buy a new bicycle. You could buy a generator. And they're offering them all this cash for their maize. The wise Malawans will say, no, I need that in month 11, 10, 11, 12, or my family's going to go hungry. One of my friends was saying, the temptation is to look up at your rafters and go, man. And, and this is for guys. They'll look at it and go, I could get that second wife. And he said, that's a temptation. And so they'll sell five, ten bags of maize. They'll pay the dowry for the second wife. He says, but then by month nine, the maize is gone. The, the new wife is hungry. She goes back to her family. It's a dry season now. So he's got no maize and no wife. You know, it happens in Chandler and Gilbert all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> Those things happen. But we're all tempted to not budget. If we're honest, nobody likes a budget. I, I came across a study. This is a brand new study uh, that was just done, and it's titled Young Adults Dread Budgeting. All right, no, no, no surprise there. But here's a few of the findings. They found that 57% of young adults say they dread budgeting. 54% of young adults say they would rather be on a strict food diet than a budget. 33% of young adults said they would rather deep clean their toilet than see how much money they had in the bank. All right. 23% uh, of young adults said they would rather run a 5K on Thanksgiving morning than live with a budget. All right. Like the worst thing in the world than budget. <laughs> Now, what is a budget? Now, I'm assuming everybody here knows what we're talking about, but a budget is simply a chart of accounts, a list of your income versus a list of your expenses. And the hope is that, that you have a gap between your expenses and your income. Uh, the problem is that in our economy, the way we live in America today, expenses have this way of rising to meet income, doesn't it? But the disciplined person, the disciplined person knows that I have to have that gap. I have to have that gap between my income and my expenses so that I can give, so that I can live generously, so that I can save up for the future, so that I can have something for my children and my grandchildren. Having a budget allows you to allocate and plan and be disciplined and live within your means. The Africans know if I overeat today, there won't be enough for tomorrow. I want to challenge you to start thinking like that. Budget and create financial freedom. Uh, my family for several years has used the Every Dollar app. If you want something simple like that to track your spending, I encourage you to do that. All right, here's the third challenge from Proverbs. And, and it's to eliminate debt and trust God in the dry season. So in Proverbs 27, Solomon says this. Solomon says, the borrower is slave to the lender. Man, that's harsh language. But any of us that have had debt and struggled with it, you know that you feel like you're a slave to the lender. Solomon is right. I think the temptation for all of us, it's just a human tendency, is to solve our financial problems with debt. And that doesn't do it. It takes the discipline of a budget. So my challenge with you to you today is if you have bad debt, to start to eliminate that debt, start to get rid of it. When we were in Malawi, you heard Paul say that we held a chief conference for 105 chiefs. And this head chief, because, and I want to preface this by saying one of the things that debt does is that debt robs from your future. Debt sacrifices your future. Anyway, so we have this room full of chiefs, 105 chiefs. And then the Nkosi, his majesty, gets up to speak, all right? So Josh plays some music. I get to give a challenge, and then the Nkosi gets up. And he starts to speak to these chiefs, and he says, listen to me. He says, tell your people to stop selling their land. Because what's happening is the city of Lilongwe is now 5 million people. And so people with income in the city are going out to the villages and the rural areas and offering cash for plots of land. And then they build a cement wall around it and build their house. The problem is it's destroying the villages. It's destroying the communities and the tribes. And so the Nkosi, the head of all the chiefs, is saying, tell your people to stop selling the land. Then he gives this analogy. It's a great analogy. He says, when your people sell their land, they're selling their future. He said, it's like the cat eating 
a pregnant rat. All right, you have to let that sink in. Because that, we, we deal with that in the East Valley all the time, is your cat eats a pregnant rat. But he says, the cat knows not to eat the pregnant rat because that's for the future meals and future months. I, I hope that makes sense to you. It made sense over there. Anyway, I think debt is like that. When you go into debt, you sacrifice your future. You heard me use the phrase bad debt. I, I think there, there is some necessary debt, like, like, like a home loan, but if your home is an appreciating asset, but there's a lot of things that we put our money into in debt that are not appreciating assets. I'll be honest with you, bad birdie golf wear is not an appreciating asset. Lululemon is not, Michael Kors is not an appreciating asset. Peloton, nothing you can say about that is not an appreciating asset. Here's what bad debt does. Bad debt says, I don't trust God to meet my needs in the dry season. The dry season teaches us to trust God, teaches us that God can provide. Bad debt says, I don't have a plan. Bad debt says, I can't wait for the things that I want, that I need it right now. Bad debt says that I am dissatisfied with what God has given me already. I'm discontent, so I'm going to go into debt to have it. And so my challenge to you is to eliminate that kind of debt. Bad debt says, like I said, I have to have it now. I've watched my four sons graduate from Perry High and Basha. And some of their friends, when they graduate, make great decisions about college and their future. But then I watch some of their friends graduate from high school and make the worst financial decision. I remember watching one of their friends. He graduates from high school that summer, gets a job. And it's a good job. They promote him to manager within like 30 days. He gets one of his first paychecks. And what does he do? He drives down to the Ford dealer. But a, but with $500 down, buys a Mustang, brand new Mustang off the lot. His payment's like $850 a month for the next six years. His debt is so high, he never can go to college. Can I, do you see what I mean? That debt, as, as Solomon says, you become slave to the lender. Dave Ramsey, if you've, if you've heard any of his advice, he's brilliant on these things. He's a godly man that talks about our finances. And my family has learned a lot from him. But Dave Ramsey says to run from debt like a gazelle. Now, we were just in Malawi. They don't have gazelle in Malawi, but we do have Impala. So we were in this game park. There's, by the way, Impala can run up to 50 miles an hour. They're stinking fast. And so when he says run like a gazelle from debt, or with gazelle or, or impala intensity. We, we had uh, not just gazelle, they also had water, but I have to show you the water buck here. So the water buck, I didn't know this till our guide says, do you see the circle on the backside? So when the lion comes into a herd, it's trying to split the herd and, and get one of the water buck isolated. And so they've developed this circle on their backside, and when they're running through the bush, they can follow each other. And, but I'm thinking this, if you've got a circle on your backside and the lion's after you, he sees that too, all right? You're a dead donkey at that point. You're, you're, you're not, so don't run like a water bug. That's a, that's a point here. Let's go back to the gazelle, or I'm sorry, the, the impala. Much better, much better. Anyway, so Dave Ramsey says, you know, attack debt with that kind of intensity. Go after it. Get rid of it. Uh, he, his advice is always to, to start with the smallest debt first. If you have debt and you want to get rid of it, or you want to build your savings account, start a side hustle. Sell things in your garage. Do something else to create an income. Right now, my twin brother, Paul, who's lived in Malawi for more than 30 years, he's trying to create revenue for farmers in the dry season because he's realized that over the years that farmers have these, all of these corn stalks that are going to waste. Um, so he's created a... Uh, a briquette, small factory here, and he's trying to scale it right now. But these small briquettes, uh, they come from, so right now in Malawi, when anyone cooks their maids, it's called, it's called sima and, and ufa, but when they go to cook it, they put it in a pot, but they, everyone across the country wants to cook it with a wood-burning fire. But it's destroying, it, they're deforesting the entire country. So I want to show you a picture of the corn stalk. So do we have that next? Here we go. So when we were there, all over Malawi were these piles of of, of corn stalks. So they've harvested the maize, they've left the stalks. They don't leave them lay in the field because they attract the mice and they attract the snakes. 
We're not there yet. But anyway, so, so when the kids, when they're ready to get rid of these, they just light them on fire. And when they light them on fire, the kids from the village go around them. And then as the mice run out, they beat them with sticks. Next picture. And, uh, and then they end up with mice on a stick. They let it sun dry. And then these kids stand on the side of the road selling it to people that are traveling by. And it's called Mice on a Stick. It's a delicacy. It's a, it's a lot like stopping at Love's for some uh, beef jerky. So that's next picture. Uh, here's one of our Azungus, our fearless leader, Paul Gunther. I don't think he quite got it in his mouth, maybe just the tail or the head. We're trying to give him more money to bite the whole thing, but that didn't happen. All right, next picture. All that to say is that my brother now is taking this. He has a mulching machine that's mulching the corn. Last slide. And they're developing these briquettes. But the idea is this waste on the farm. He wants to turn it into profit for the farmers. He wants to buy this, this, uh, these leftover corn stalks from them and turn it into something that will stop the deforestation as well. So all that to say is, be creative. Start a side hustle. What resources are you wasting that could turn into something that God can use? All right, next lesson from Solomon. And it's plant. The rain is coming. All right, plant. The rain is coming. In the dry season, and I'll just say this next, that if you're going through a financial dry season, you feel like it's going to go on forever. But I want to say that there's work that God calls you to do in the dry season. What, what is the next step that you need to take? In Africa, at the height of the dry season, you plant and you believe and you trust that the rain is coming. Here's what, what Solomon says in Proverbs 10.22. He says, it is the Lord's blessing that brings wealth. In Africa, when the dry season is at its peak, um, you, when you want to give up, like I said, that's when you plant. This is a picture of the boobob tree. And uh, I talked about this tree about, oh, five, six weeks ago. And some say it's a tree planted, God planted it upside down. But most people call it the tree of life because it looks like those are all roots. So about six, eight months out of the year, there are no leaves on the boobob tree. But as we're going through the game park, our guide said to us, and I, I never heard this before. He says, our ancestors didn't have calendars. They weren't sure when to plant the seed. Because in the dry season, you just kind of hope the rain will come. But he said, when the boobob tree starts to form leaves, when the leaves bud, we know the rains are coming. And so this tree of life is a signal to the community to plant your seed. The rain is coming. The rain always comes. The Africans know that. The dry season feels like it will go on forever, but the rain always comes. Here's what the Bible says about rain and blessing. Listen to this. Like I said, rain is always a picture of blessing. In Job, we read, he gives rain on the earth and sends water to the fields. Leviticus, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Joel, rejoice, you people of, rejo of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rain he sends is coming. The autumn rains will come as, as well as the rains of spring. So he's saying here, celebrate, the rain is coming. So maybe right now you have been in a dry season. Maybe it feels impossible. I'm sharing what I'm sharing today, and maybe your, your dry season has been a financial one. I want to say that God always follows the dry season with a season of blessing. I think we can forget this promise in Scripture. I want to put Genesis 1, 26 and 7 on the screen here. Because we all know how Genesis 1 reads, where God says, let us make human beings in our image, and he creates them, he creates male and female. But then we forget what verse 27 says. Verse 27, we read, and God blessed them. And he says to you, he says to us, he says, prosper. So he blesses. He didn't just create you to go through dry seasons forever, but he says, we read that he blesses, and he says, go out and prosper. All right, here's one last lesson that I want to share today from Proverbs, and it's this. Share, convert your blessing. In Proverbs 11, we read this. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Look at Ecclesiastes. This is, again, Solomon, the wise king. He says, be generous. Invest in acts of charity. Charity heals high returns. Don't hoard your goods. Spread them around. Be a blessing to others. 
When the clouds are full of water, it rains. How do you like that? Are, are your clouds full of water? Uh, if God, and, and this is what Solomon is saying, if God has filled your clouds with water, let it rain on others. If God has blessed you, then convert your blessing. I want to ask you a question as we close. What, as we close, what has God given you that is, is meant for you to turn around and use as a blessing for somebody else? Because so often that God, God blesses us and all we do is store up. We never share that blessing with someone else. But Jesus says this, that when you turn around and you turn that, you convert that blessing into a blessing of someone for someone else, you become the blessed one. I think there's this misnomer that only affluent people, only wealthy people are generous and can tithe and can bless people. And I want to say, no, there's this Bible lesson from Jesus himself where he says, look at the widow. Oh, she just gives one cent and she's the most generous one. His point is this, give out of your poverty. Maybe you feel poor today living in Chandler and Gilbert. I want to say you're not. If you've ever been to an African village, you know you're not, that you have more than most of the world. The question is, are you converting, no matter how small your blessing is, are you converting that into a blessing for others? Don't wait for someone else to be that blessing. In Malawi, we were there at harvest time. And at harvest time in Malawi, they, they, they have a Sunday that they declare as harvest Sunday. You're supposed to bring your first fruits. And I've been there when, when the poorest of the poor in the world bring piles of sugar cane and mangoes and oranges and papaya and pineapple, and they pile them at the church door so that the elders can share it with the widows and the orphans in the village. These are the poorest of the poor. When our people were there, they brought our women their peanut harvest. And our women were trying to say, no, we, we don't want to take your, your peanut. If they knew that you had to accept this act of generosity. And so I want to simply end by saying, in what way has God blessed you? Are you converting that blessing into a blessing for others? Would you stand as we close? Uh, Josh and Andrea have picked this song about rain and blessing. It's beautiful. Sing these words as a prayer today.